Good morning, church. Our family would like to extend a warm welcome on behalf of Water Street Church as you all watch from your home. And for those that don't know us, we are the Stoder family. These are my daughters, Annika, and this is Ruby. And although we are not gathered together with all of you, we can still invite you to worship our holy God and to continue to pray for each other. Before we get started, we have a few announcements to share. The deacons have set up a Guelph Relief Fund. This will be used to meet the immediate needs of our local organizations that are serving our vulnerable population in the city of Guelph. Having a fund like this allows response to be quick and really to the pressing needs of our community. If you would like to donate to this fund, please earmark donations, Guelph Relief Fund, and payments can be dropped off at the church. Some of you have also been asking about regular payments to the church, and uh, these can also be done by dropping off a check or cash at the church, and they will also get processed. Some of you are currently on PAR, the pre-authorized remittance from your bank account each month. If you are interested in doing that as well, you can please uh, call John Bell. People can continue to drop off food and hygiene donations to the church on Tuesday mornings from 9 to 11 a.m. Items that are especially needed at this time are diapers, formula, eggs, and feminine hygiene products. This week, the church is also accepting, accepting baked goods like cookies, squares, and muffins for the Royal City Mission and the Drop-In Centre. Please put baked goods in large Ziploc bags and drop off to the church on Tuesday morning between 9 and 11 a.m. so that Amy can arrange a time to deliver all items at once. Our call to worship this morning will be a responsive reading. Lord our God, you are so awesome. You are beyond what we can imagine possible. When we take a look at all that you have done and all that you have made, we wonder why you care for people like us. You have given us an honorable position on this earth of ours, to care for the things you have made, to preserve them and maintain them. You have entrusted living things to us. Lord, our Lord, the whole earth, earth recognizes, recognizes how awesome you are. Hello friends, somebody reminded me this past week that uh, every time we deliver one of these messages, we are doing so and you are watching these messages from your living room. And so as we begin our worship service this morning, as we are welcomed into God's presence, I thought the appropriate position for me to take is a seat in your living room. And so as we enter into worship, people of God receive God's welcome. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the fellowship of his spirit be with you all. And we say together, amen. As we begin our time together, let us join together in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we come into your presence giving you our worship because you are worthy of all worship. We give you thanks, Lord, that we could gather in our virtual spaces together, that we could gather around, uh, around the message of your resurrection, that you have conquered the power of sin and the power of the grave. And we thank you, Lord, again, that we can gather in our spaces, raising our voices in praise to you, and again, coming to you in the appropriate position of worship, and that is in the position of submission. We are your people, and we give you thanks, Lord, that you have claimed us through Jesus Christ, your Son. And all of God's people say together, Amen. Please join us for the prayer of confession. The Spirit of our Lord fills the world. His glory shines when we look to see. You know our every word and deed. All of this you have already seen. Let us then open ourselves to the Lord. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith. For you raise the dead to life in the Spirit and through your Son. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. You bring healing and your hope fills the wounded. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You make one by your spirit the torn and divided. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Now, hear the good news, for here are words that you may trust, and in them find assurance. Words that will fill us with hope. Christ Jesus came to this world to save this world, to save sinners like you and I. To all who confess their sins and resolve to lead a life defined and renewed by faith, God says, your sins are forgiven. We are told, come, follow me. To the one who rules this and all of creation, let us give honor and glory forever and ever. Join us as we sing of our faith and creed. In God the Father, I believe. Oh 
I'm coming to you from a different place today. Welcome to my house. You're in your house, I'm in my house. This is kind of fun. I invite you to get a little closer up to the screen, get comfy, and today we're gonna talk a little bit about what it means to talk to God. So first of all, do you know that God loves it when you talk to him? But maybe you're thinking, how do I do that? Well, we, we talk to God when we pray to him. So just like we share life with our mom and dad and our friends and our brothers and sisters, and we tell these people what matters to us, we want to do the same thing with God. We want to share our life with him, every single part of it. And so even though we can't see God, we can talk to him through prayer. So I have five things I want you to remember. First thing, God hears us if we talk out loud or if we talk in our hearts. It might help us if we say our words out loud just to keep us focused, but God will hear them no matter what. He promises that he hears us all throughout the Bible. Number two, we can talk to God just like we talk to anyone else that we love and respect. We don't need to use special words or talk in a certain order. There's nothing fancy about it. The one special word we sometimes use is the word amen at the end of our prayer. And we do this to show that we believe that God has heard our prayer and that he will answer it in his perfect way. The third thing I want you to know is that we use our bodies when we pray. Sometimes we might sit in a chair like this. Other times we might stand up. Sometimes we might kneel down. We might be laying in our beds. We might fold our hands. We might lift our hands. We might hold somebody else's hands. It looks different. I actually asked a couple of friends to share how, how it looks like when they pray. I think you'll like this. I think you might recognize them. Check it out. And I pray and I fold my hands and I do this. When I pray, I fold my hands and keep my eyes open because when I keep my eyes closed, I feel uncomfortable. So you can see, it looks a little different for everyone and that's okay. There's no right or wrong way in how you pray. What really matters is that your mind is focused on God and that your heart loves him. The fourth thing I want you to remember is that you can pray anywhere. At the table, when you're in your bed, when you're at school or home or outside, riding your bike, doing your chores, it doesn't matter. God will hear you wherever you are. He just wants you to know that when you pray to him, it's not about impressing other people or showing off. It's all about you and him. That's the most important thing. Nobody else really matters. The last thing, number five, I want you to know and remember is that you can pray to God about anything. He wants you to tell him everything, things that might make you feel afraid or things that make you feel really happy, things that you're thankful for and things that you need help with. There's nothing too big or too small that you can talk to God about. He wants to hear it all. We're gonna keep talking about prayer in the next couple of weeks, so I have a challenge for you. Uh, this week. I started to set up a space, maybe you can see it on my wall, where I'm going to make this my prayer wall. 
And so I started to decorate it already and I'm going to add things that I want to remember to pray for every week. And we're going to, we're going to use different things to do that. So this week I made a prayer chain and I want to, I want to show you and encourage you to do the same. Maybe you want to do that now or later on, but write down things you want to remember to pray for. This one says, Please keep my family safe. It's something that's important to me right now. So I want to remember to pray about that and to talk to God about that. Another one says, thank you for flowers because they're some of my favorite things and make me so happy that I want to remember to thank God for them. You can take and add new chains every day or, or throughout the week when things come to your mind. And then you can put it in this space that you made your prayer space so that you can take it and go through it the rest of the week. And, and those are your reminders of things you want to pray for. The other thing I want to ask you to do now as you watch the rest of your of this service is to think about something you want to talk to God about. Maybe it's something you're thankful for or that you need help with or that you're excited and happy for, and you just want to share that with him. Do that by drawing a picture, or writing a poem, or putting it together with Play-Doh, or Lego, or be creative. Use your imagination. But take some time now, as, as the rest of the service happens, to think about things you want to talk to God for. Before I go, can we just pray together? Maybe you want to fold your hands or close your eyes or keep them open. That's okay too, whatever makes you more comfortable. Maybe you want to stand and be able to wiggle a little. Let's just come and talk to God. Dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can talk to you about anything and everything. We thank you that you love us and we ask that you be near to us this day and that we may celebrate the fact that we are your kids. In your name we pray. Amen. Bye guys. Have a good week. Easter Sunday morning. Normally, we wake up and we go to church and the phrase, Christ is risen, is shouted in the sanctuary. Last week felt a lot different. I woke up in the morning and there was a word on in my mind and that word was Corona. And I wasn't dreaming about a refreshing Mexican beer 
I was dreaming and thinking about a virus. And it is that word that has been in my mind almost every morning from the time I wake up almost to the time I sleep. As we entered into this Easter season beginning last week, there is something quite different about my experience of Easter this year than normally. Oh, it's true, last week my family and I got up and, and we went to church. Although church was very different, church was in our living room. I engaged in the fertility rituals of the season, these fertility rituals that become a metaphor for new life, the fertility rituals of bunnies bouncing around and mating and laying all sorts of eggs for our eating pleasure. I filled my candy jars with those Easter eggs and enjoyed them as a tasty treat throughout this week as kind of a reprieve for the bad taste that this coronavirus has left in my mouth. As we come into Easter this year, our experience is different, isn't it? Some of us might wonder to ourselves, well, what is the relevance of the risen Lord when a virus is infecting our world, when the darkness of an economy that has caused many people to lose their lives, or not lives, their jobs, is affecting many of us too. We wonder, what does it all mean? And today we are looking at a passage of scripture that comes from the book of John. We've been in this book for some weeks now. It's the story of two men, one named Cleopas and another is unnamed. And they're on their, a road to Emmaus. And we'll read that passage of scripture in a few short minutes. Before we read that passage of scripture, I'd like to lead us in a word of prayer. Gracious God, speak to us through your word. Speak to us through your word made flesh, your son, Jesus Christ. Remind us each day that you walk with us. And we ask, Lord, that through your Holy Spirit, you would comfort us. For we pray in Jesus' name. And we say together, Amen. Luke 24, verses 13 to 35, on the road to Emmaus. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened here in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. 
They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. Perhaps you've noticed that there is a glaring error or miss, something missing from the order of service, and that is we have not done the prayers of the people. I've decided that I'm going to insert the prayers of the people into the body of the service, in the body of the sermon, I should say. As we think about this story of two men walking on that road to Emmaus, those two men who had witnessed their Savior hanging from a cross, we perhaps enter into their experience of grief and into their experience of despair. And we can do so especially now because as we look around our world, there is, are all of those things. There is grief and there is certainly lots of people who are experiencing dis despair. One of my favorite authors, C.S. Lewis, when talking about the death of his wife, Joy, said or thought that he might lift some of the, uh, the burden of grief by not frequenting those places that he and his wife, Joy, had once, once frequented. And so he would shop at a different shopping center. He would go for walks on different paths that than he and his wife had once walked on. He would, uh, he would go and try and do different things and go to different restaurants than the restaurants that he and his wife had once enjoyed. And after trying that, uh, that out for a while, he concluded and said it didn't work. He reflected on his experience and he said, grief is like the sky. It encompasses everything. It is over everything. Grief is like that. And as we come into this passage of scripture, this passage from John chapter 21, this story of two men walking out of Jerusalem after bearing witness to their Savior hanging on a cross. It is into this experience of despair that we meet these two men. As these two men are walking on that road, it was Sunday afternoon after they had witnessed Jesus Christ hanging from the cross we get a sense of their confusion and their defeat. These men are heading down a road back to their lives, back to their workaday lives, because their Savior had been put to death. When they met a stranger walking toward them with his back to the sun, they didn't have any idea who he was. And so he asks them what they were discussing. And these two men express amazement. It's like this, uh, this, this stranger comes up to them and says, Howdy, folks, what's going on? And these two men say, Haven't you heard? Don't you know what's going on or what happened in Jerusalem? And maybe they shouldn't have been surprised because the death of, uh, of, of, of somebody like Jesus wouldn't have reached the ears of everyone. It would have been maybe fifth page news. As we look at this story, these men are, are, are surprised that Jesus hadn't heard or this stranger hadn't heard. And so they respond to this stranger's question. And we read these words in ch uh, chapter 21 and verse 21. We had hoped that he would be the one to save Israel. Those words, we had hoped. 
We had hoped. Those words are, are words that have echoed across time, and those words are, are words that we continue to express today. We had hoped. We had hoped that this virus would be like the original SARS virus and, and stay located in Toronto or in Wuhan, far away from this or far away from us, we had hoped. Or, or we had hoped that the CAT scan would have just been a false alarm, or, or we had hoped that, that the loss of memory was just a, a, a momentary loss. We had hoped that the diagnosis wouldn't be dementia. We had hoped, we had hoped the company could survive the economic downturns. We had hoped, we had hoped. And in these words, these two men, Cleopas and the other disciple, walking along that road, express their lament, their cry. They are wondering about the events that they had borne witness to. And they express their lament in those three words, we had hoped. What do we do with our lament? As Jesus is walking with these two men, the emotional uh, state that these two men are in can be characterized in the word despair. The one that they had loved, the one that they had followed has died Oh, there's, it's true that there are rumors of his resurrection, but when, when they had gone there, they didn't see anything except an empty tomb. And they, at this moment in time, are leaving the city of Jerusalem, and they are leaving that city at a loss. What do we do with our lament? And I want to explore Scripture and how Scripture tells us to bring our cries of lament before God and there are lots of examples in Scripture of lament. I want to read for you just a few. We read these words in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 12. We are powerless before the vast multitude that comes against us. We are at a loss of what to do. Hence, our eyes are turned toward you. These words were expressed in 850 B.C., when the host of enemies that were assailed against Jerusalem, those enemies from Ammon and Moab and Edom, what is modern day uh, Jordan, had rallied themselves and had surrounded the city of Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat, the king, calls the people of Israel to a prayer. And this is the prayer that he calls them to utter. We bring our prayer before you, our eyes are turned towards you. As we look at the Psalms, there are over 50 Psalms that are actually laments. That's close to one third of the Psalms. Job utters these words in his lament. Why did I not perish at birth? Come forth from the womb and expire, he asks the Lord. And Jesus himself in the garden of Gethsemane laments. He cries out to God, Abba, Father, all things are possible with you. Take this cup from me, he cries out. And we ask this question, well, what is a lament? A, a lament is, is bringing our sorrow before God. When life feels blessed, when life is good, we bring before God our praise, but when we experience life's brokenness, when we experience chaos, when we experience suffering and death, when we experience our human vulnerability as in a virus that has infected an entire world, we cry out and we call those cries lament. When people feel physical suffering, they say, ouch! And a lament is a spiritual or our soul crying, ouch. What do we do when we lament? 
What we do is we bring our cry and we direct those cries toward God out of the depths. I, I cried to you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my voice. My soul too, it is utterly terrified. But you, O Lord, how long? Psalm 6 verse 4. And the cries of lament in Scripture, they, uh, they encompass the entire human experience from physical sickness to loneliness and alienation to the loss of friends to danger and mistreatment even aging and especially death as one author has said in an article about lament lament is one of those forms of prayer that we have lost in the church and that is to our detriment. He said, we need to regain this form of prayer, for it is in praying our laments that we bring our faith before God. It is not lack of faith that drives us to lament. It is faith in a God who describes himself as personal, a God who walks with us, that drives us to lament when we look around our world and we see sorrow. For faith is not merely an intellectual assent to some propositions about God. Faith is trusting our whole lives to God. Faith is, is placing our, our lives into the hands of God who says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will walk with you. And those are the promises of God that we see throughout Scripture. Those are the promises of God given to Isaac as he, as he stands before the Philistine king and in his fear, God says, I will walk with you. And to the anxious Moses as he's on his way to, to stand in front of the Pharaoh to appeal for the lives of the people of Israel, in his fear, God says to Moses, I will walk with you. And to the disciples, whom he meets as he walks across water, uh, walks across the water, he says to the, those disciples, I will be with you, I am with you. The second thing a lament is, outside of the fact that it is a cry for, that, that we utter to God in the midst of our faith, a lament is a longing for meaning. And that is a, a lifelong pursuit, and this is no small endeavor. And, and we dare not reach for shallow, superficial answers to the problems of, of, of life. Lament teaches us that there are indeed things that are outside of the realm of hum, our human capacity to understand. Our human mind can only take us so far. At times we can do no more than speak our confusion to God and lament tells us that we should do no less. And one last thing about the laments that we see in scripture. Some of those laments express a, a depth of despair, even a, a desire for vengeance when injustice has threatened to overwhelm them. And, and it's true that we long to get to that place where we can cry like our Savior, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. But there are experiences, experiences of injustice, experiences of sorrow that we must express in order for us to get there in order for us to get to that place where we can act charitably. As we think about lament, as we think about the hopes of these two men, I want to lead you now in a time of prayer. This will be in place of the prayers of the people I invite you at any point during this prayer to pause the video and if you want to spend some time with your family or in the quietness of your home praying a cry of lament, I would invite you to pause but please come back. There is more.
that this scripture has to teach us. I'm going to be using some of the Psalms as the backbone for our lament. And so let us join now together in a time of prayer. Look toward me and have pity on me. For I am alone and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and bring me out of my distress. Put an end to my affliction and my suffering. Take all of my sin. Preserve my life and rescue me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. Show us, O Lord, your kindness and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God proclaims the Lord, for he proclaims peace to his people and to his faithful ones and to those who put their hope in him. him. Near indeed is his salvation to those who fear him. Glory dwelling in your land. And so we lay before you the needs of our world. We have heard statistics this past week that are startling. The loss of 4 million jobs in a country of 3.7 million people. That represents one in nine people who are without work. And we long, Lord, and we ask that you would intercede on, on their behalf on, and on our behalf. For we are a community of people and we need you. Many say, oh, that we might see better times. Oh, Lord, let the light of your countenance shine on us. You put gladness into my heart more than when grain and wine abound. As soon as I lie down, I fall asleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, bring security to my dwelling. And as the psalmist prays that prayer, we too pray that, oh, we might see better times. We pray, Lord, that you would wipe this virus from the face of this earth. We pray, Lord, for those, especially for those who are experiencing the nearness of loss. Be near to the Mandagarian family after the loss of Christine Mandagarian. We ask, Lord, that you would be near to all of those senior homes that we've heard about this past week that are struggling and suffering under the weight of loss. Be near to the personal support workers and the nurses and the doctors that care for these elderly people, some of them who are dying. In the middle of this, we utter the, these words, we trust in your unfailing love, and we bring our lament before you, and we ask these things, and we pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. These two men walking that road to Emmaus, saying those words, we had hoped that he would be the savior of Israel. And suddenly this man who seemed so clueless just a moment before asking them what they were talking about, suddenly he changes. He has the audacity to call them foolish. This stranger then launches into a discussion about the Bible. And, and we don't get a great deal of detail ex about exactly what he says, but we are told that from Moses and through the prophets, Jesus Christ showed how, how uh, uh, this man, I should say, because they don't know it's Jesus Christ just yet. This man showed uh, how the Bible showed himself throughout the pages of the Old Testament. And we might say to ourselves, opening the scriptures, that seems so strange. Come on. It seems so removed from the experience of their despair. 
Jesus Christ in that moment takes the scripts that these men had known, that had shaped their minds, the script had, that had given them rules about how the world worked, rules about how God himself would work, ideas about the structures that, that people clung to, that, that differentiated between those who were good and those who were evil, those whom God would reward and those whom God would punish. And he unfolds scripture. And, and I'm sure the message that he was bringing was this message that, that God, as he acts through Jesus Christ, was acting in a world where there were no heroes, where there were no people that we could divide between those who are good and those who are evil. There are no heroes in this story except Jesus Christ himself. As Jesus Christ unfolds scriptures, as, as the disciples would later unfold the scriptures, the things that they would point to, the things that they would talk about, the things that they would, would tell the people about God himself was his, his mercy and his love, his scandalous love for all people. The scandalous message of the gospel is that Christ reaches out to sinners like you and me, People who are lost in despair like those men on the road to Emmaus. As Jesus Christ unfolds scriptures, suddenly they come to the end of the road. They come to the home to which these two men were going. They are in Emmaus. And we are told that it was the end of the night or it was becoming dusk. And Cleopas says to this stranger, why don't you stay with us for the night? We aren't told why, but we can guess. This was a hospitable place. This was a place where people would welcome strangers into their home, especially at night, because thieves and robbers would, would do their business at night. And so after going into their home, Jesus, and after uh, uh, cleaning off the dust from their journey, washing their face, washing their hands and their feet, they sit down for a meal. And as they sit down for a meal, they begin to break bread together. And, and there's something familiar in the breaking of bread. There's something familiar about the way the man uh, uh, conducts the meal, uh, the, way, the way the man, uh, or the way this man feeds those who are around him. As one author writes, I believe that although these two dis disciples did not recognize Jesus on the road to Emmaus, uh, Emmaus, Jesus recognized them. Then he saw them as if they were the only two people in the world. And I believe that the reason why the resurrection is more than just an extraordinary event that took place some 2,000 years ago and then was over and done with, even as I speak these words and even as you listen to them, he writes, he also sees us like that. In this dark world where you and I see so little because of our unrecognizing eyes, he whose eye is on the sparrow is on each and every single one of us. And I believe that because he sees us, not even the darkness of death are we lost to him, or, and not even in the darkness of death are we lost to each other. I believe that whether we recognize him, him or not, or believe in him or not, or even know his name, again and again he comes and walks a little way with us. He walks with us on our journey. And we don't know how Jesus Christ or when Jesus Christ will meet us, but he does. And when he does, he offers us himself. He offers us his body. And he offers us his blood the bread of life, and when he does so, he gives us a new hope, a new vision for life, a new light that not even our dark world can snuff out. Friends in Jesus Christ, it is my deep prayer that each of us would be met by Jesus Christ in these dark times. 
And one of the ways that, that Jesus Christ meets us, one of the ways that he calls us to is, is to bring our lives before him. And even if that means that we express our lament, he invites us to do so. For many of us are suffering. But Jesus Christ says, I am with you. I am walking with you. And that, my friends, is the good news of the gospel that is the news that we live by, especially in times like these. Shall we close now our time in a word of prayer? Our gracious God and heavenly Father, we pray, Lord, that you would walk with us on our road. We pray, Lord, that when we cry out, our hope was in you. And, and when we don't see you, we pray, Lord, that you would walk with us. Remind us again through the words of your scripture, of your mercy and grace. Remind us again that it is in you that we will experience life once again. And we pray, Lord, in the, that in the darkness of these times, you would pierce the darkness with the light of your son, Jesus Christ. For we pray in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen. We respond now to this word from God in song. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Shall we say? As we depart and go into whatever we have planned for the remainder of this day, we go and we listen again to the word of God from the book of Philippians chapter 4. Paul writes these words, to a people that need also need to be encouraged. He writes, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all, for the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and by petition. Present your requests to God, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. Dear friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you. May the Lord lift up his face on, upon you, and may he give you his peace. We say together, Amen. Go now in peace and hope. Go now in peace and hope. Go now in peace and hope.